Okay, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I'm Ed Snyder. I'm an anthropologist from uh, John Jay College in um, Manhattan. Good morning, everybody. My paper today is somewhat outside the field of architecture and design. As I said, I'm an anthropologist, and my co-author, Shauna Trench, who could not make it here today, is a sociolinguist. We became interested in retail shop signs while studying gentrification and redevelopment. Okay, again, my apologies. Um, we, in 2010, we began doing field work on what had been called the Atlantic Yards Conflict, now the Barclays Center Arena, and a plan to build 16 high-rise um, residential towers in central Brooklyn. But our Atlantic Yards research brought us to take a sustained look at the rest of the urban landscape, and in particular, retail storefronts. So when one of us remarked to a class of John Jay students that Brooklyn is the kind of place where people cram as many words as possible onto a storefront sign, our anthropology students let out a laugh of recognition. And many of them are New York City natives. Um, and they told us that these word-rich signs represented a back in the dayness or an old school Brooklyn. Their laughter motiv motivated us to unpack the meaning of this type of writing on signs that we knew to be uh, an historically diverse multi-ethnic, multi-class, and multi-religious city. So alongside our research on the Atlantic Yards battles, we photographed more than 2,000 Brooklyn storefronts. And as we did urban ethnography, we also noted what people had to say about them. Our research revealed essentially two styles of signs. The first, which you've just seen many examples, are word rich and are found across the entire borough. The second type of sign we found was rather terse with only one or two words, and which appeared on relatively new businesses and neighborhoods undergoing change. This says bump. From the perspective of linguistics, it's a maternity store. Um, these two types of signs were telling us two very different stories about Brooklyn. Shop signs call to those already in place, as we have seen, but they also attract those who are not yet there. Like all forms of writing, retail signs operate through specific language ideologies. And as public texts, they also operate as placemaking tools. And let me demonstrate these functions by showing you some examples. We'll start with the first type, which we call, by our, uh, inspired by our students' old school Brooklyn vernacular. Um, obviously, a key feature of this type are lots of words. And abundant wording is not limited to any one type of retail establishment. That's an important detail. For example, we find more than 30 words on the facade of a garden store in Bay Ridge. A storefront for a daycare in Carroll Gardens contains 60 words. While multiple words are the most common characteristic, these texts also share an array of additional features. For starters, they, well, they include ancillary signage. And such signage can give a clue as to how the old school style targets people from a range of social classes. For example, small ATM signs placed in store windows indicate the acceptance of cash or debit cards and offering uh, for smaller bills for those who have limited resources. Another old school feature are store names uh, that refer to location, surnames, uh, first names, and type of business or the product that is sold. For example, this is the Third Street newsstand. Uh, this is Pena's food market, the owner, uh, Juanita's bridal shop, and Cleve A. Brown, who offers financial services. This sign also shows a, another feature common in old school, which is reiteration and repetition, often several times, um, on the sign or the storefront. Old school signs also often include languages other than English, but this is important. They always include English on the sign. Here is a Russian deli, and here is a, a Middle Eastern grocery. Old school, old school signs often include explicit and sincere references to religion, ethnicity, national origin, or race. So here we have Islam fashion. We have Little Lords, Little Ladies, which does advertise explicitly Christian ritual wear. Uh, Mitchell's Soul Food. And this is Jennifer's Hair Salon, which specializes in African-American hairstyles, which it depicts on the uh, sign itself. Frequently, there are syncretic or multicultural references in the old school style, but they always include English text. This is No Pork Halal Kitchen, a Chinese restaurant that is strictly halal. And here's Garden Tortillas. It actually should say tortillas. Um, Tex Mexican and Chinese food, and that's in uh, Diker Heights. Old school also contains complementary symbols, pictographs, 
uh, images, uh, perhaps for customers or passers-by who cannot read English or maybe any other language for that matter. This is authentic kosher Italian food, but you see that the pizza slice indicates what they offer. And back to the Middle Eastern grocer has a picture of a, a cow and a ram. And finally, non-standard English is common on many old school signs. Uh, this is cold cut on the newsstand, which actually should say cold cuts. And if you notice the ad for big sale swimming wear on a bargain store in uh, my neighborhood, it actually should be swimwear, and if it was swimming wear, it should have two M's. We argue that old school Brooklyn vernacular is an indication of what Jane Jacobs uh, referred to as neighborhood vitality. But linguistically, we also see how this vernacular performs an openness to difference. As texts of inclusivity, these old school signs are a vivid testament to a specific form of local capitalism. Our informant supported this reading of inclusion. One Brooklynite told us the stores, like these, they want you to know directly that they can meet your basic needs, so they put it all out there on their sign. Another informant told us that these multi-word signs were friendly, locally owned, and made everyone feel welcome. And these public texts, as you can see, sometimes say this literally. Here's all nationalities welcome. They do an aggressively democratic system of economic exchange, at least on their text. Their frequent non-standard forms of English indicate an environment of tolerance where one language does not have dominance over any other. Their literalness shows a make no mistakeness and an aim to communicate as clearly as possible to complete strangers. Strangers from diverse class, backgrounds, ethnicities, races, and religions. In short, these signs are very thorough. But appearing with more frequency every year is another type of sign, which performs a completely different place-making uh, function. Textually, these signs are word sparse. Okay. Um, here is a restaurant in a neighborhood at Prospect Heights with the single word James on its storefront. In adjacent Park Slope, uh, Bird uh, doesn't tell us what the business sells, but it does sell upscale yet casual women's clothing. These new signs, which we call distinction-making signs, kind of following Bourdieu, exhibit a shared set of linguistic and textual features, but these features are very different from their old-school predecessors. Obviously, they include one word or short phrase, often in lowercase text. Here's, a, here's beast. We're not really sure what that is. Um, this is the second feature. They have cryptic or multiple meanings to their names, or they may be literary references. For example, hipsqueak, which combines the idea of pipsqueak and hipness, sells fashion-forward clothing and obviously expensive. A shop selling handmade ice cream says Ample Hills Creamery. A well-read reader might note that Ample Hills comes from the 1865 Walt Whitman poem, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, and invokes all the sensual wordplay which Whitman probably intended in his poetry. New signs also make witty and historically perhaps erudite place references. On one store's awning, you see Cornelius, but if you look on the adjacent street sign on the corner, Vanderbilt Avenue, the two texts together reveal a clever homage to the wealthy and powerful 19th century New York steamship magnate. Finally, if new signs use languages other than English, it is only to index worldliness rather than literalness. So here you have Legamine, I think it means mischievous boy. Um, <laughs> and here's Palo Santo, or Holy Wood in, in Spanish. And there is absolutely no English translation to help the passerby. The overarching language ideology on new signage follows the Shakespearean aphorism, brevity is the soul of wit. This ideology prevails in writing courses, grammar books, and in US college classrooms, which you probably know. And it contrasts sharply with the repetitions, long lists, and literal meanings of old school. Such signs might also provide a semantic operation that can feel like an experience of intellectual exclusivity. And our informants have said, these signs are actually trying to sell you a lifestyle or an attitude. Um, many of our informants thought New Brooklyn signs incorporated a simplicity that was elegant, sophisticated, and modern. Paradoxically, none of them were concerned with the fact that you couldn't really tell what the stores were actually selling. So this sort of writing on the land declares Brooklyn as, a, as a, both a different and a distinctive kind of place, 
different not only from chain stores, but also from non-distinctive open capitalism of their old school neighbors. Old school placemaking recognized difference, but it did not treat difference with distinction. And old school signs did not take anything for granted. So in contrast, on this gentrified shopping block, you see that these signs take a lot for granted. They assume their customers can deal with any price point, or they do not need halal food. They assume that their customers speak English, and that if they want to know more about them, they will Google them. Notably, distinction-making signs produce feelings of exclusion for people on the losing side of the gentrification equation. A Queens native told us that one-word signs are almost like a secret club. If you don't already know what's inside, you don't need to know or belong there. And a lifelong Brooklyn resident remarked, the one-word Brooklyn storefronts do not welcome the public. And as a Brooklynite, she added, I think it is offensive. Now she was talking about signs that I have just shown you. Here are examples of other signs that we also found in our data in, that use race, class, ethnicity, um, uh, and religion ironically. If one thinks about different readers and possible meanings, such signage might also be offensive to some passers-by. Here's Trailer Park, a repurposed secondhand furniture store in uh, Park Slope. This is Outpost, the colonial um, implication and references is possible, and it's in an upscale coffee house in working class Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. This is Baby Mama. It is uh, another uh, mother and uh, uh, baby um, clothing store, and um, it's in South Brooklyn. Uh, baby Mama is also slang in African American for an unwed mother. And this is Don Chingon, which came, opened up right across from the Barclays Center on Flatbush Avenue. And our Spanish informants have told us that it translate, translates into badass motherfucker <laughs> on the street. Again, there's, there's no English here to show you. So to quickly close, um, in the wake of an encroaching distinction-making style, newer old school shops do attempt to adapt to the threat of gentrification using the time-honored strategy of inclusion. If you notice the non-standard flower on top, they sell flowers. Um, it is this actually went up a couple of years ago. They also announced on their awning that they offer organic produce, and it's an indication of um, what, their, what an upper class or upscale market would like to see. And this is an old school mini mart that has put up a handwritten sign, also in non-standard English, we accept credit card, which again, these businesses were, were often cash based. Um, since I have limited time, I'll simply close by noting in our research, we've also been looking at how both old school and distinction making signs in Brooklyn have been encroached by the appearance of more corporate signage. Of course, such signage is neither exclusionary or exclusive, but rather than recognizing any difference, it seeks to erase all distinction and arguably the very idea of placeness and ultimately the idea of Brooklyn itself. Thank you. Thank you.